Welcome to Cobain Le Bon's part two. What we're going to do is continue to talk about electronegativity and covalent bonding, as well as a little bit of metallic bonding. Now, you might ask yourself, well, gosh, do I have to memorize the electronegativity chart? Heck no, you don't. I'm always going to give you this chart because I wouldn't want anyone to have to memorize this. All right? You do, I mean, as I mentioned in the past, we do want to remember that fluorine's the king with a 4.0. And then everything else gets lower from that. It decreases as you go down and decreases as you go this way, right? But if we want to kind of figure out exactly which way it is, let's, uh, we've got a way of doing this. And this is the, the chart from your book. If the difference between a polar and a non uh, let me let me slow down. If the difference between... The, the two elements, their electronegativity is greater than 5, but less than 2.1. It's, if it, it's in this range, it's a polar covalent bond. If it's between 0 and 0.5, we'll call it a polar, a nonpolar covalent. And then on an ionic will be greater than 2.1. Now, this scale is kind of random. In, in, a, in a previous textbook that I had, it used to be 1.3 and 1.7. So it really kind of depends on the publisher. The idea that you want to know is that this is kind of a sliding scale. As you go this way, you're moving to more polar and eventually to ionic. That's the important concept. The greater the difference... the difference the more polar all right which of course includes ionic as being superpolar okay so there we go so let's just kind of look at a couple examples and try and figure out how would how would these fall in the scale i've got a few on this next page all right. Now, if you want to go ahead and pause the video right here or do it all by yourself, feel free to do so. That's fine. Um, but I'm just going to go over it right now. So I'm looking at this first compound right here, which happens to be one I really like, water. Okay. Oxygen has a 3.5 electronegativity. Hydrogen has a 2.1. What's the difference? 1.4, right? So what are you going to call that? You're going to call hydrogen a polar covalent molecule. And I'll show you that in a demonstration. That's actually pretty interesting. right? What about NaCl? Well, without even looking at the chart, we've got a metal, non-metal, ionic, right? Chromium iodide. Ooh, chromium, 1.6 iodide. Now, let's not worry about this part right here, okay? We're just kind of making this simple for ourselves. Uh, iodide's 2.5. What's the difference? 0 0.9. All right. Now, 0 0.9 means it's a polar covalent molecule. However, it's a metal and a nonmetal. So that's one of the problems with this little model we have. But we're just going to, for our purposes, we'll go ahead and say, oh, that's a polar covalent. All right. Calcium and selenium. Calcium's 1.0. Selenium is 2.4. There we go. That's going to be polar covalent. Arsenic and phosphorus. Let's see. Arsenic is 2.0. Phosphorus is 2.1. Okay. I'm going to call this nonpolar covalent. All right. For zinc sulfide, let's see. Zinc, 1.6. Sulfur, 2.5. Difference, 0 0.9. Uh, polar covalent. So you can see that see the idea. I don't want to work on the rest of those, but that's the idea. All right. Now I didn't I didn't show you a picture. I wanted to show you this one picture of kind of the way polar molecules line up. Okay. So let's say the water. Remember I I said that uh, you know the oxygen would be a more negative and the hydrogen side would be more positive. You can see how they kind of line up. And, and as I mentioned, this is one of the things that gets. Uh, uh, gives them their properties. There's a reason that water takes a fairly high temperature to boil, and that's because of this attractive force. So the simplest definition of a polar molecule is simply one that has a 
partial positive and one that has a partial negative. So you can see with water, as I've been mentioning, there's the partial positive uh, and here's the partial negative. Now we call this a dipole and you could think of it just like magnets. You have a north pole and a south pole. The other thing that you'll often see is you'll see polarity shown by a delta symbol, which is this one right here. And often, here's my awesome delta symbol, you'll see a little positive or a negative uh, with it. And then last but not least with polar molecules, um, when you have a big difference in electronegativity, you're talking about uh, molecules that have strong bonds and they will end up having larger bond energy. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, if we were to look back at the chart here, and we would get some big numbers, numbers that were in this area for polar covalent. You know, maybe they're 2.0 or something. When you get big differences like that, that largest difference would, uh, would mean you would have the strongest bond. Now there's one last little bit of bonding I want to talk about, and it has to do with metals. Right? Because maybe you've never really thought about this, but remember, things are sticking together because, as far as we know, they have opposite charges, right? Okay, or they're sharing electrons. Okay, but what about if you've got a piece of metal? Like, let's say I have a big chunk of gold, right, which I'd like to have since it's about $1,800 an ounce right now. Let's say I have a big chunk of gold. How in the world are those atoms sticking together? They're definitely not oppositely charged because if, it, if we were talking about an ion of, of uh, gold, it would be positively charged. And they're definitely not sharing their electrons in the way that uh, molecules do to make a uh, covalent bond. So we have this new kind. A, well, I shouldn't say new. We have a different way of that, that our model is for metallic bonds. And that is the valence electrons move from one atom to another. And they're kind of sharing all their valence electrons. Right? So again, there's these attractive forces and uh, repulsive forces enough to keep the metals together, but they kind of share their electrons. Now, they're good conductors because of this, because let's imagine I attached a wire here, and I attach it to a battery, 6-volt battery, okay? and I had a circuit, and let's say I have a little light bulb, right? Okay. Well, electrons will flow. And as they hit the metal, of course they're traveling in this metal, they're just bumping electrons over, bumping electrons over, bumping electrons over. So that makes this electron go this way. And then they'll flow and flow and so on. Right? And so metals are really good conductors of electricity. It also has to do with why they're good conductors of heat. They're, uh, this sea of electrons, this uh, metallic bonding, uh, really makes them... Uh, melt at a, at a high temperature, mostly because uh, the way that uh, bonding occurs. All right. And then last but not least, I've got one more little thing about, you know, ionic bonds, just because this whole, this whole podcast is kind of review. But this is stuff we know. Don't need to write this down unless you don't remember. Ionic bonds are strong, hard to break, and we know that their melting points are very high, right? It's hard to break apart two oppositely charged things. Things that are sharing electrons, like molecules, they're easy to uh, break apart. All right, so there's our podcast on bonding. Uh, again, like always, if you have any questions about this covalent bond stuff, let me know, and we'll discuss it in class. See you next time.